Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, we're talking about different aspects about prayer. And it's just amazing how um, there's so much the Bible teaches about prayer. And yet, I'm not sure how you are, but there's sometimes I struggle with it. Is that, um, is it the right way to do things? What am I saying is the right thing? And, uh, and then, I don't know how you are, but prayer relaxes me. Is that um, I don't get on my knees very often because first my knees killing me. But um, also, I mean, I could literally be praying and then within just a few moments, I'll wake up a half hour later. What happened? I fell asleep. It just, re it relaxes me because my mind isn't thinking about all my problems. My mind is thinking about heaven, thinking about the Lord, thinking about family. And so it just, it takes, it just takes me to a different realm. And the one thing I love about our Savior is that he did not have the, the belief of do as I say, not as I do. He did it and he practiced it. So Philippians chapter four, verses six and seven says this. It says, be careful for nothing. Don't worry, don't stress, but in everything. So everything was by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known unto God and the peace of God, which passes all understanding. So we um, pray, we uh, intercede, we're thankful. And God says, because you do that, let me reciprocate and I'm going to give you the peace. I'm going to take away all your problems and I'm going to, I'm going to replace that with my peace. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts um, and minds through Christ Jesus. I mentioned this morning, and um, of course, there's a lot of things I keep on Facebook I put on there just as the fact of that I could follow up with for the year and things like that. Uh, but yesterday I came across that... Um, it was the day that we found out that mom had had stage four lung cancer. And the, I, I'll never forget that because uh, we all went in there and, and, and mom, they did the biopsy. And then while mom was in recovery, the rest of the family, they went over to um, to the cafeteria. Some went outside to smoke. Some other folks did some phone calls. And I said, I'll just stay here. And I knew the doctor and he knew me. And so he came out first, he said, so where's the family? I said, well, right now, let me go get him. He says, no, uh, you're a minister, right? I said, yes, sir. He said, this is what I want you to tell your family. Your mom has cancer. She's got stage four lung cancer. And um, I can't do anything for her. Uh, wait a minute, you're, you're going to tell her. No, you're the minister. You tell her. And he walked out. Was I angry? Oh, yeah. I was frustrated. And so when the family got in there, they're all, where's the doctor? Where's the doctor? I said, well, let me tell you what's going on. And I tell them, of course, they express themselves a lot more vo verbally. And then um, they said, uh, who's going to tell mom? I said, well, I've been tasked with that. And I said, she's not going to like it. And I said, I can tell you exactly what she's going to say. She says, when do I get to see the doctor? I already got the date. It's next week. And uh, I said, she's going to share her feelings. And, and she's going to give me a little bit of love. And... Uh, and so, I mean, so I told her she was, of course, I had much more better bedside manners than the doctor did. And um, so I said, Mom, this is what's going on. Is that, told her that. She says, did he say how much time I have left? No. She says, when do I get to see him? This day. She said, okay. She said, I want everyone of you to be in the room, but I don't want you to say a word. It's my body. It's my situation. I will speak. You understand me? Yes, ma'am. But the fact is this, is that through all of that, and yes, you have the motions, but as tough of a situation it was, it wasn't like I, I went off the deep end. It's just like God says, I've got this. It's going to be okay. And that's where it passes all understanding. You just, where does it come from? And how long does it last? And what's the purpose? Of it? God says, he gives that peace to let you know that he's with you and that peace, which is a picture of his presence, just lets us know, hey, you're not going to walk through this valley alone. I'm going to always be with you. And when you talk about praying, look at Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. And then we're going to, yes. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. I know that. It is well known for his lack of bedside manner. And other things. First one of Acts chapter one. 
It says this. Now, Luke is writing this book. Luke writes two books in the New Testament, the, book, the Gospel of Luke, but he also is a physician and he writes the book of Acts. It says this. The former treatise, talking about the other book, have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to, look at the next word, do and teach. Jesus lived it and then told the people how to do it. So we're going to look at some aspects of times of his private devotions, the times when he got alone. So first of all, look at Mark chapter 1, Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1, verse 35. So he prayed in the morning. Verse 35 says this, And in the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed. So one of the aspects of prayer is praying in the morning. Then also look at Mark chapter 6, Mark chapter 6. Look at verse 45 and 46 says this. And straightway he constrained his disciples to get into the ship and to go to the other side before unto Bethsaida while he sent away the people. And when he had set, sent them away, he departed into a mountain to pray. So he prayed in the morning. He prayed in the evening. Look at Luke chapter 5, Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5, verse 15 and 16. Verse 15 says this in Mark, uh, Luke chapter 5. But so much the more went there a fame abroad of him, and great multitudes came together to hear and to be healed by him of their infirmities. And he withdrew himself into the wilderness and prayed. So he prayed in the morning, he prayed in the evening, he prayed in solitary communion. Look at Luke chapter 6, Luke chapter 6, look at verse 12. Luke 6, 12 says this, And it came to pass in those days that he went out into a mountain to pray, and continued all night in prayer to God. So we had all night prayer meetings also. So we prayed in the morning. He prayed at the night. He prayed in solitary communion. But he also had all night prayer meetings. So we read in Acts chapter 1, these, these things Jesus began both to do and to teach. So if and the Bible says in the book of uh, Peter that we're supposed to walk in his steps. So if we're going to walk in his steps and follow the life of Jesus, and emulate him that our prayer life should involve morning prayer. It should involve evening prayer. It should be times when we just get away from everybody in solitary, solitary communion. Now, that could be any time. For me, my solitary communion is to get in the car. Or uh, like this last Wednesday, I was up in Kansas City, up at the Negro Baseball Hall of Fame. And um, I was alone. What did I do? I had a chance to. Talk to the Lord, solitary confinement, not confinement, okay? <laughs> so, <laughs> <that's> a, <laughs> communion. <laughs> I was not in prison. <laughs> but solitary communion is that there's no one there, there's no distractions. There's no one there to talk to. Now, I'm not sure how you are, but there have been times where I just want to pray, either get a phone call, or something comes across, I've got to get this done. Or other things come up, or distractions, something comes up. And I personally believe that that is nothing but Satan trying to use to stop us from praying. He doesn't want us to talk to our Father. He doesn't want us to commune with the, the one that can answer our prayers, the one that can help us and give us that peace. He wants us to live in this constant world of confusion and frustration and just constant stirring up of things. He doesn't want us. Satan doesn't want us to be peaceful and calm 
and not stressful. And so Satan's going to do everything he can to offset everything that God does. So all night prayer. Now, if you've ever attempted it, that's difficult. Especially when you used to be in a bed at a certain time and getting up at a certain time. But um, if you purposely do that, um, for me, I had to drink lots of coffee. I had to be alone. When I was up in Northern Virginia, there would just be times where I would just spend time at the church. No one there. And I'd tell the son, I'll see you in the morning. And I'd be up at the church. And I'd just walk the properties. I'd be in my office and praying and read my Bible. And just, it was just me and God. But those were some times I was seeking some specific direction in my life. I was seeking for God to intercede and work through things that I saw no other way to get to except God. If God didn't do it, it wasn't going to happen. So those times of, of uh, all night prayer. But then also, look at Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, look at verse 18. He prayed with his disciples. Verse 18 says this. And it came to pass as he was alone praying, his disciples were with him. And he asked them saying, whom say the people that I am? So his disciples, those people that he was training, do you know that the disciples came to Jesus and said, Jesus, will you teach us how to pray as John taught his disciples? They were so intrigued at see, to, have, to have John the Baptist to teach his disciples, his followers, that why didn't he do that with us? And so they said, would you please teach us? So Jesus modeled his prayer life and taught his disciples how to pray. I've been saved for 40, 44 years. And um, in the very beginning stages of my, prayer, of my Christian walk, I learned a lot about Christianity by watching those leaders in our church on how to pray, how to witness, do those things. And sometimes when you're a young believer, you want to emulate everything about that person instead of the characteristic. And so I learned praying by listening to my pastor, by listening to my youth director, by listening to the men of the church, by listening to the women of the church, and listening to the Sunday school teachers. And so... And then when I went to Bible college, I would listen to my different professors. And then by listening and learning and reading, my style, if you want to call it that, has been crafted because I put all these different ingredients together, mixed it all up. It's okay, God, put what's in here, make me what I need to be. So when you talk about prayer, there are some that their prayer lives are totally different. And so we don't compare our Christianity when that comes to our prayer. If it's effective for them, praise God for that. Also understand that's different people's personalities also. I mean, I've heard, I've heard old-time evangelists, I mean, those old uh, leather-long preachers, man, they'd get up, they'd yell and scream and beat a pulpit, run all over the auditorium and stuff like that. Their praying was like, God, I want you to do this, I want you to do this, and God, you've got to do this. And But their, their heartfelt praying they're weeping and but that's their style of praying whereas you may have another person that'd be soft and what we consider timid but god answered their prayers too so who's right both of them are right because they were letting god use them in the personality that god gave to them to minister that's the great thing about the body of christ everybody's different but one common cause christian or christ and so Jesus was teaching and modeling how to pray. Also, look at Luke 22. Luke 22. Luke 22, verse 41. says this, and he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. 
Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. He prayed in the garden. The significance of the garden, the significance of a place of peace, the significance of the garden is a place of growth. It's a place of provision. It's a place of protection. It's a place that was noted. Say, garden, yes. God used gardens. And Jesus used gardens. So we look at all these different places that he prayed at, and when you talk about one of the most significant prayers of Jesus, it's the very fact is that, Lord, God, if it be possible, take this from me. That was in the garden. That was at the, near the end of, um, or the beginning of the crucifixion stage. But that's where he prayed. He didn't do it. And the great thing about the Lord is that he didn't do these great, grandiose prayers around everybody. He did it alone and with the very core people that he, was, he came and called to train. And so when it says that Jesus began both to do and teach, he did it, people observed it, then he showed them how to be able to go from where they were, where, where they were to where they needed to be in their prayer lives. And so... When you look at the fact that Jesus had his own private devotions, then we as, as, as his followers should have those times also. And there's no right time, there's no wrong time when it comes, comes time to walk with the Lord. When I was in Bible college and I would work, you know, I'd work all night and then I would come home, shower, clean up and go to the, um, to the school. And what, before I went to my first hour of class at, at, at eight o'clock, I'd go and get me a Mountain Dew and a, a bear claw and a packet of honey to stay awake. And then I'd be reading my Bible. That was, it was a thing that I did every day so I can stay awake because I'd work for eight, 10, 12 hour shifts at an oil refinery. But whether it was there or I'd, there, I'd go to chapel or in the, whatever, the fact is that for me, I found the best time for me during those times, and it's changed since then, I'll say that now I'll wake up at two o'clock in the morning and just get up and say, what am I up for? <laughs> I should be sleeping. I've never had this problem about getting up two or three o'clock in the morning. Well, now I know why. Because that's the time that God says, okay, let's talk. Because even Snoopy sleeping, or by sleeping, there's no one walking around, no noises. It's just me and God time. And to me, the fact is when God says, let's talk, and it gets me out of slumber, to me it says, my God cares enough about me that this way there's no distractions. It's just me and him. That's why there's a peace that passes all understanding, because I'm in the presence of God. Why? Because I'm learning, and it's a, it's a, it's a lifelong learning uh, of training on how to pray, of learning how to get into the scriptures and learn what God wants you to learn and pull those things out. It's lifelong. And so when God does those special times, to me, it, it just it's special. And so when you think about those times for us that's special with God, can you imagine how Jesus felt? when he was away from his heavenly father. And so he spent those special times with him in during the morning, during the evening, solitary communion, an all-night prayer in the garden, and only with his disciples. So the aspect of private devotions of Christ was very important. And those are just basics on where we see where Jesus prayed. But then also... Um, it talks about the peace that passes understanding, the provisions of peace. And we're going to look at a couple of these, and then we'll try to finish them uh, up next week. Look at Psalms 29. In fact, we'll just end with this. Psalms 29. Psalm 29, verse 11. Provisions of peace is a gift from God. Verse 11 says this, The Lord will give strength unto his people. Ever felt God lifting you up and giving you the strength when you can't go on? 
the Lord will bless his people with what? Peace. It's a gift. He will bless his people with peace. Let's look at one more. Isaiah 46. Isaiah 46. So not only is it a gift from God, a gift of God, but also Isaiah 46. Well, let me see if I can find it. I wrote the wrong reference down. Well, if you can find it, it's like a river. The Lord will give us peace like a river. When you think about a river, what do you think about those characteristics? Constantly flowing. What else? It never empties. What else? It per, what's that? It's relaxing. It's, um, it provides for everyone that participates in it. It is there. It is just there for anyone or anything to take advantage of or enjoy. If he gives us peace like a river, just allow those characteristics to apply it to your own life. The fact is that when you are struggling, when you are going through some life situations that are challenging, is that go to that river. I never forget the fact is this, is that Lucinda, when she struggled with sleeping, she would turn on water music. She, says, she would go online and say, I need to hear water raining. I just need to hear water music. And that would put her out. And then one, one day I said, so what's the significance of water? She said, I just think about uh, how I feel when there's a, a rainstorm. I'm in a house, and just the fact that that rain hit in the house, it just relaxes her, and it puts her out to sleep. And as believers... There's nothing greater than to be able to put your head on a pillow and then wake up after five, six, seven hours stand, uh, sleeping and be waking up refreshed. That's called peace. And so when you think about this water that's constantly flowing that God wants to give us called peace, and it's just like feeling like you do after a full night's rest. It's like, wow, I feel a whole lot better. And that's that peace that passes all understanding. Father, help us tonight speak to our hearts and challenge us regarding the aspect about prayer. We thank you for your example, but also this thing about peace is that you give that to us because you are the Prince of Peace. And you give us different illustrations for us to be able to see, uh, of, of us to be able to understand what it's all about. Now, Father, we do not know what this week holds, but you do. So intercede and bless the special way. Be with each one that's here. Keep us safe. Bring us back to the next appointed hour. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Well, Brother Bob, if you'll come, we'll take up an offering. So don't forget, Wednesday night is prayer meeting. Uh, we have one more change offering. Uh, I guarantee you after today's change offering, I think there must have been enough change to add about five pounds to that bucket. That was, I just could, I used to be able to just pick it up with one hand and move it. Now I had to use two hands. And so uh, it always excites me. And what will even excite me is that Monday after the, lux, the next change offering is to walk inside the bank and to watch people scatter and then have the manager. I already talked to her. She, she said, I've already got just the right person that'll do that if she's here. So. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, and it's just, it, it's all become a big joke to them and, and they laugh about it. But the fact is that what a testimony to know that what this church is doing to change stuff like that, to fill these up, and they're going to be going somewhere for Jesus Christ. And so that's what we pray, and God can do some great things. Folks, you have a good night. Lil Willow, we'll see you next time the doors are open. Stay safe and understand we're supposed to have that stuff called rain this week. I don't know what it's like, but we'll find out. Okay. I'm good. I'm good. Thank you.